Hawks on the Wire is a podcast produced by Three Hawks Haven, an e-card company where love, kindness, and connection are designed in each e-card. The story you're about to hear, shared by Joan's guest, will be a story from someone's life, their personal experience. By learning from stories just like this, Three Hawks Haven is able to create beautiful and moving e-cards that can really touch someone's heart. In times of celebration or in the tougher times of life, Three Hawks Haven has e-cards for most any occasion, including some you just can't find anywhere else. You can shop for all their e-cards by going to their website, threehawkshaven.com. Now to Hawks on the Wire with your host, Joan. My name is Joan, and I'm your host for Hawks on the Wire, a podcast brought to you by 3hawkshaven.com. And today our guest is Dawn, and she is going to talk about the difficulties and the challenges that she faced with a difficult pregnancy. Dawn, how are you doing today, beautiful lady? Doing well, thank you, Joan. Good to be here. Oh, thank you for being here. And do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, yes. Um, of course, I met you years ago. We both are nurses. We worked at uh, Baptist Hospital East and a um, long time ago, but I'm, I'm still a nurse. Um, um, I've applied to nurse practitioner school. Good for um, you. Yeah, thank you. I was thinking I was going to go into teaching um, just because I love kids and love, you know, teaching things down at a normal level, you know, yeah. and so I basically was trying to pursue that and I missed nursing really badly and so decided to go back and do nurse practitioner route. Good for you and good luck with that. Thank you. So today we're going to share, I know you have, you do have three children and Andy is your youngest and his pregnancy was rather difficult. You had some challenges and so we want to talk about that, huh? Mm -hmm. Definitely. It was, it was a rough way to go. Do you want me to um, backtrack and talk a little bit about my other pregnancies um, no, I think we're, we're good as far as uh, we, you had, how old were your girls when Andy was born? Um, four and eight. Okay. So yeah. you realized you were pregnant. You had told me uh, a lot of women when they're first pregnant, they are very hypersensitive with their smells and you were making some type of bread. I think you said. Yeah. Yeah. I was, it was funny. Um, I'll just backtrack a little bit when, um, I had had my two girls. Um, we didn't know if we could have any more children. I was nearing the 40 year level. Um, and so my dad had passed away in 2010 and we were trying to get pregnant. And I think he had passed away on Father's Day. Um, and then a few months later, I found out I was pregnant and we had gotten um, our oldest, Ashley, a birthday card in September and basically said, you're going to be a big sister. Well, I miscarried at that point. Yeah. Um, that was devastating. And yeah. then several months later, I got pregnant again and miscarried again. Oh, and at that point, yes. yeah, it was, it, I was feeling pretty hopeless. And I asked my doctor, I'm like, what is going on? Why am I miscarrying? And he's, you know, he was being really sweet about it. And he said, it's probably your age. And so at that point, we were just, like I said, completely devastated. My husband was too. And I remember being at church and I think the fourth girl had announced in Sunday school that she was pregnant. And even though she was pregnant and ex I was excited for her, I was, I had tears streaming down my face in the back row because I was just like, oh my goodness, all these people are getting pregnant and I'm not. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of women feel that way <laughs> when they're having fertility issues. Yeah. So yeah, they can be happy for somebody, but at the same time, deep down it, it yeah. kills very much wishing that oh I want I want that so much mm -hmm. yeah so at that time you did not know but you really were pregnant yes yes I had no symptoms and with my other two pregnancies 
I was with Ashley. I was sick all the time with Emily. I was nauseated the first trimester, I think, but I didn't have a single inkling I was pregnant. And so I was getting ready to make bread and I opened the bucket of grain and I just felt a little bit queasy. And I was like, this is strange. This has never made me feel nauseated before. So I was like, I wonder if I should just take a pregnancy test. Mm -hmm. So I did, and it was positive, and I was through the roof, excited. And your husband, yeah. too, Travis, your husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were excited, but cautious, because we had had the two miscarriages before, so we didn't want to get our hopes up. So I called the doctor's office. I went in and got a blood test, and basically my HCG levels, and a lot of women will know those are the levels they test you to see if you're pregnant, and they were way high. And so um, I was analyzing, I'm like, what could this be? And I thought I would maybe had an ectopic pregnancy or twins or something like that. But little did I know um, when they did the ultrasound and everything, I was 10 weeks pregnant <laughs> already and hadn't had a single symptom except that nausea. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So well, I think, oh, sorry, good. Well, so I was thinking you had told me maybe when you were like around four months, is that when you had some bleeding issues and then you had to go to the hospital? Um, yeah, I was around 20 weeks. I woke up on Christmas morning and I thought I had urinated on myself and I looked at the bed and there was a pool of blood there and I screamed for my husband and went to the bathroom and I had blood dripping all over the bathroom floor and I got in the shower to rinse off and I had blood all over the bathtub. So we um, basically he, called. He, huh? took, he took you to the hospital. Yeah, yeah. And we called um, our next door neighbor. <laughs> like I said, it was around four or something in the morning. Oh, right. And so we had called and she didn't answer. We called again and she got up. And like I said, it was Christmas morning that, that morning. So she came over to our house to watch the girls. And I had put a cover over our bed because we were just in a hurry to get to the hospital. And, you know, she basically washed all the sheets for us. She said she didn't want the girls to be upset or nervous. Yeah. So she on that end, took care of our kids all that Christmas day over her house. What a good friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's amazing. I don't know what we would have done without her. Yes. So, so you went to the hospital mm -hmm. and, and you went to ER. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went to the ER and um, we basically, I was telling you this before we went in there and they asked how far along I was. And it was real iffy because I've had irregular periods my whole life. And so we couldn't pinpoint a due date or anything exactly. And so they asked me, I said, I think I'm around 19 or 20 weeks. And at that point, I didn't know what they were going to do. And they were discussing amongst themselves, should we send her to the ER or up to labor and delivery? And at that moment, like I said, I didn't know what was going on. So I felt like inside that they were making a decision if my baby was going to live or die. And that was just a horrible feeling. Um, so um, fast forward a little bit, they decided to send me up to labor and delivery. Um, and my doctor had been on call and had, was going home. He was off call and came back to the hospital to see me. And um, he did the ultras an ultrasound basically, and they heard the heartbeat. And oh. we were just overwhelmed. We're like, oh my gosh, because I thought my baby had passed away. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, um, he came and I was really upset and he sat on the edge of the bed and he just uh, tapped through the blanket, tapped my leg gently. And he wasn't above me standing up. He was sitting right at eye level and everything. And that made me so reassured. And it was amazing. I just can't tell. Yeah. I can't tell how much it meant to me, but um, so we should talk about that a little bit. The fact mm -hmm. that, you know, nurses and doctors and their, their empathy and their compassion. And you obviously trusted him so much. That meant so much to you. Yeah, I did. I mean, it, it was just, if you have somebody that you can reach at a heart level, it's amazing. And it just takes away all your anxiety and everything. And it's yeah. just so healing. That's so important. Mm -hmm, it is. So he, uh, did huh? he well, you go ahead. You go ahead with your story. So he kind of told you where you were with your pregnancy. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And how long did you stay in the hospital? Well, I, I think I was just there that the rest of that day, but we had a high risk specialist that was coming in to do, you know, look a little bit further. I, I said ultrasound before I met Doppler when they heard the heartbeat, but they okay. did the ultrasound. And um, basically he said, you've got to, 
a big clot and your placenta has separated. And, and I was like, is my baby going to live or die? And he's like, well, I can't tell you that. My mom always said, and he muttered something and it was so nonchalant and <laughs> it just devastated me. And I was like, oh my gosh, my baby is perfectly healthy and is possibly just going to slip out of my body basically. And that was overwhelming to me. And it had to have been scary. It was. I mean, you know, it sounds strange, but I had a kind of guilt about it too. Like this was my body doing this. I know that is sounds crazy, but I think women do that a lot to ourselves. Yes, yeah, like it was your fault, you're saying. But mm -hmm. it really wasn't. And we want right. our listeners to know that, huh? It, it's not the woman's fault. Exactly. Yeah. So um, so anyway, that um specialist said, Do you want to know the sex? And I looked at my husband and he looked at me and we have had two girls at that point and we're like sure and so we found out it was a boy and I was sobbing even more just the whole emotions around the yes. ultrasound and what could possibly happen and I think that doctor was really smart and but he was robotic and he wasn't very emotional and he basically just robotically patted me on my shoulder you know like it's going to be okay but <laughs> it was it wasn't comforting it was but later on I realized you know that was probably really big for him to do you know he probably had to go outside of himself to do that yes. just simple gesture of patting me on the shoulder that's, so that's big of you to realize that too Don. and and but there's a comparison that you're saying you know it it helps your anxiety so much when the when the other doctor could be so empathetic to you yeah just a more on your level sit down look you in the eye you know, use the, you know, power of touch just to, you know, reassure somebody, you know, that person you, you've trusted him, you felt connected to him. Oh yes, definitely. I, I would trust him and my kids life. Yes. So, so then did you stay in the hospital a couple of days or? I think I was discharged later that day okay. and they basically, um, had put me on bed rest. I was on bed rest for a few months with him. Okay. And that means how many months for one thing? Were you on like four months? I think it was around four months. Okay. And I basically, they had found out I was on bed rest with my first child and I was in a wheelchair and everything, but they found that that's not great for you. So they allowed me to have bathroom privileges, get up on the couch and things like that. I was able to walk a tiny bit yeah. around. So, so, but I want to hear about this because your life really changed because before you were on bed rest, you were driving, right? Mm -hmm. Up oh, and yeah. Working, and were you working outside of the home also? No, I wasn't. Um, I was homeschooling the kids at that point. Okay. Um, I had taken off nursing for a little while to, you know, help raise the kids and um, homeschool them. And so we were doing all kinds of things and we would go out and do meet different moms with kids do all kinds of activities out of the home it was amazing I, we were just very busy all the time <laughs> wonderful mm -hmm. and, and then the so the girls were used to that routine but once mm -hmm. you had your bed rest you could not go outside the home no I mean so how did you how did you get yourself to accept that it was hard because I'm a person that likes to do things and Yes. And you had just said it was wonderful homeschooling and you were with the other parents and the other children. Mm -hmm. How did the girls do? They did fine because honestly, it was, it took, it takes a village. Like I've told you before, we had people that came in and um, would take the girls out and do activities or be at the house with us and do some things inside that I could do. And we would, you know, do puzzles and read and do little crafts and the girls were great about it. It was kind of fun to them, you know, to have mommy sitting there in the yeah. living room and do all the different things. So we still try to do activities, but I will say without people helping, it would have been really difficult. Mm -hmm. And just having those people around me to the moms that came and did stuff with me was helped me as well. Recharge my batteries and, you know, filled me with joy. <laughs> Yes, and have those other an adult conversation with other adults. Mm -hmm. so, you know, that's that can be difficult for me, and I think a lot of people is to accept to accept help. Was yes, it difficult for you. It is because I'm very independent and I like to do everything myself. <laughs> that's my nature, but I, I had to learn to accept that from other people and not feel like I was putting anybody out because nobody was making me feel that way. That was just the way I was feeling. 
Oh, very so, so you kind of retaught yourself. I did. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> and what about Travis, your husband? Because I know that changed up his routine too. It was, was he cooking or were your friends bringing in food or a mixture of both? Or? Um, I think a mixture of both, but he, he cooked a lot and he kind of took the lead on everything. He made sure the kids got out if we didn't have you know, somebody for a couple of days coming over, he would go take them and do things. And we had, you know, people that came and fa my family and friends that came and helped clean the house and different things like that. Cause of course I couldn't push a vacuum cleaner, but he always picked up the slack everywhere. I mean, the fact the dads sometimes in these situations get overlooked, but they do yeah. everything. They just keep everything running. And he was amazing and never made me feel bad about any of it. Yes. And uh, it's a big shout out to Travis and to other dads that are in similar mm -hmm. situations that Travis stepped up to the plate, didn't he? Oh, definitely. And I was going to say too, a, a part of this and probably other women have gone through it is the emotional, emotional component of being afraid of losing your child. You know, that was always in the back of my mind, you know, I've got to, I basically told myself, I need to do this for my child. So basically mm -hmm. my placenta doesn't, you know, go. And, right. Did yeah. You, Travis talk about that too? Like your fears and his fears? Did you? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. We have, we share everything and he's very reassuring about those kind of things. And he's Good. supports me a hundred percent, but it's funny because I was going to backtrack a little bit, you know, when I was, didn't know I was pregnant and I, I found out I was 10 weeks pregnant. I think God didn't have me have any symptoms because he was sparing me the pain of worrying if my, I was going to miscarry my child. Yes. And so back through that, that I held on to that later. Like, why would I come this far if yeah. God was doing that for me? Yes. Yes. Good thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I would have honestly too, if something tragic would have happened, I would have had to face that too. So, you know, you all, you all sound like a wonderful team. You would have faced it together. Yes, we definitely did. We face everything together. He's, he's an amazing person. So. And what about your girls? Because, you know, uh, kids think about a lot. Were, did they have fears for you? you know? I think they were afraid, but I think um, seeing us in the manner we basically dealt with it mm -hmm. was reassuring to them because we we tried not to make them scared you know it's not like we kept things from them but I mean they knew the seriousness of it mom has to stay on bed rest because of this and you know they allowed we allowed them to see me cry and things like that but we overall provided like hey everything's going to be okay it's going to be hard but it's going to be okay kids need to see that they don't need to see fear all the time yes <laughs> Yeah, but there's a fine balance. You got to show them emotion too, but <laughs> I agree. It is okay to cry in front of your children and then of course mm -hmm. cheer them and I do believe they will ask. You know, they will ask questions. Mhm. Mm Want to know things? Oh, definitely. They hear everything. <laughs> so, let's go forward a little bit when Andy was born. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I was 4 months of bed rest and then did you have a C-section, a scheduled? Yes, I had a scheduled C-section and I was off bed rest the last, you know, how many weeks of my pregnancy. I couldn't do a ton of stuff. So at that point I went in and I was pretty healthy. My clots had dissolved. My placenta was healed up. Good. Um, How did that feel when they told you you could, you know, start walking around a little more? And... Uh, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. <laughs> Such a relief. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. So we went in and had the C-section and everything was great. And I had two amazing doctors. Like I said, I, I trust my life in their hands completely. And the one doctor was kind of chuckling, making fun of me a little bit that, you know, when he brought Andy out, he put his arms down like the, he was weighing him down and he, like almost a bowling ball. With. Well, what did Andy weigh? Um, he was 10 pounds, six ounces. Yes, so. he was a little football player. Yeah. So he, yeah, he was my other kids were 10, 12 and Ashley was eight, seven and a half and she was three weeks early. So had big babies. My husband was 10, three when he was born. Yeah. <laughs> so it's his fault. Yes. <laughs> so, but no, I mean, everything was great. Andy had the sweetest disposition, just completely content all the time. It was, he was just amazing. And so I was in recovery and I was holding him and they said, told the one nurse told the other one get him out of her hands right now and I was like what what's going on and they that had been 
with, they did that when they were checking my pads under, and I looked at them and they were starting to weigh these little pads up on the scale and realized, Hey, I'm bleeding <laughs> a lot in order for them to have to weigh them. Oh, yeah. Scary. Goodness sakes. And Travis was there too, wasn't he in the room? <laughs> Yes, he was in there and it was kind of funny that <laughs> he was standing there and he started to kind of sway back and forth <laughs> and we're like, okay, dad, sit down. <laughs> so he's like, I can handle blood when it's my wife's blood. And no, not so much. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, yeah. So, and at that point I didn't, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. You didn't really realize what was going on exactly at that time. No, I wasn't that concerned. Like I said, I had perhaps too much faith in my doctors, but I just knew they'd handle anything that could happen. And so I was trying to tell my husband, go up and take a picture, get the video of him taking his first bath and everything. And my husband's like, I'm not leaving you down here. And the doctor looked at me and he said, he needs to stay here. Yeah. And that made me realize, oh, it's serious. So, and then I heard him on the phone talking and saying that he's got a post or a C-section that's hemorrhaging. And at that point, I was like, uh-oh, and they were typing, cross-matching the blood and everything. So I knew it was serious, and it, it got me a little scared at that point, but sure. I was still okay. Yes. <laughs> so, and then my husband, um, we waited, and they, get, they got ready to wheel me down to surgery, and I later found out he was really upset at that time because he felt like he was saying goodbye to me for the last time. Yes, so, are. that would be such a challenge for Travis. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was because the doctor had said, we don't know if we've nicked an artery or what's going on. Um, and so he was expecting that. And yeah, I didn't realize it to, still tears me up to this day because I didn't, you know, like I said, he carried everything and he was so strong and supportive. But at the same time, he was experiencing all those emotions yeah. too and those fears. Yes. So it's really hard on the dads because they have to be strong for everybody, but they have those feelings too. Yes. And a lot of times people don't ask how they're doing. Thankfully my friends and said, hey, Travis, how are you? Can we do anything for you? Very so, good. Yeah. I think it's really important to make sure the dads are okay and say, Hey, can I do this for you? Can I, you know, take the kids out or can I take you out to do something? The dads I think need a break too. Mm -hmm. That's right. And they need to be able to talk to someone maybe about everything that's going on and how they feel. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. So the surgery was successful, obviously. And mm -hmm. you had a surgery and everything was okay. And yeah. You stayed in the hospital for how many days? Um, I think it was three and a half, maybe, uh, maybe four. I can't remember it. It's been a little while, but. I wanted to get home as soon as I could, but I did have those complications. So they did want to watch me. So. Okay. Well, and I know something else we wanted to uh, just review a little bit is that at this time, I think with Andy's pregnancy, maybe that's somewhere in there. You were told you have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Yes. Well, I was, um, I had had problems breastfeeding both of my girls and um, my first daughter, Ashley, I was breastfeeding, went through all the <laughs> routines they have you do and all the herbals. Right. I could never produce enough breast milk. And she had, um, they diagnosed her with failure to thrive because I was in contact with the doctors the entire time. I would go see them every day and they'd weigh her. And I think she had lost two pounds before they discharged me from the hospital. And I remember my discharge nurse said, oh, wait, she's lost way too much weight we might have to keep you here. And then they discharged me anyway. And so I thought, oh, everything is okay. And basically, if you look at pictures now of her, it's like she was so gaunt. Mm -hmm. But like I said, the doctors were working and we were doing formula in between and everything. But I could never, no matter what I did, produce enough breast milk. Same with Emily. But mm -hmm. we realized after that, like my husband, and he was the one that said it. He said, I think she's hungry. And so we fed her a bottle and she guzzled the thing down. And we're, I was like, I'm done breast, trying to breastfeed. It's, it's just not working. And so, you told me, you know, sometimes women feel like it's, it's not okay to use formula. That no, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. we we've been told breast is best. And, you know, if your baby's not formula fed, they're going to have more allergies and they're not going to be as smart and just all these different things, which, you want to achieve that. You want to do what's best for your child. So you're put, you know, pressure is put on you by yourself and the community, you know, and I think that the nurses in the hospital, 
some of them were great and some of the lactation consultants were great, but a lot of them made you feel really inadequate, <laughs> you know, and even if you said, well, hey, can I let the nursery feed the baby, you know, at midnight or four in the morning or whatever, and they're like, no, you need to do that, you know, make it seem like you've got to try this or you're not going to succeed. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard and it was harder. So what message would you give to women that, you know, there's a lot of ways to be right. If they either choose not to breastfeed or they cannot, what message would you give women? I would just say, do what's best for you and your family. You know, even I know women that don't want to breastfeed at all and that's fine. Your baby's going to be fine. Just stop putting all that pressure on yourself and the, the women that, are able to more power to you. That's amazing. You know, I'm really glad you can do that, but don't make other women feel inferior because some women absolutely cannot breastfeed no matter what they do. Yeah. So support each other. Yes. Very good. And so with Andy, you ran into a little trouble about breastfeeding again. And oh, yeah. you said your lactation nurse mm -hmm. help there. Yeah. She, um, she would call me every day and sometimes a couple times a day and we, like I said, we did all these different things and I was on prescription medications and doing the breast pump all the time. Every time she'd call me, she'd be like, I hear the breast pump. And I was barely producing any milk, no matter what I did. Um, and so basically she said, I'm, I reviewed your chart and I think you might have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And at that point I was, I'd never heard of that. Mm -hmm. And so um, basically um, you're insulin resistant. And so she said, let's see if your doctor can put you on something called metformin and that's a medication for diabetics. Um, and so she said, it'll take a couple days, but we'll see if that'll increase your breast milk. And so I was like, okay, let's try, I'll try anything. And so sure enough at day three, my breast milk production went through the roof. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah. I mean, somebody just turned the spigot on <laughs> almost, but it was a wonder drug and it's, you know, like it's free at Meyer and, some other places it's free. So it's a really reasonable drug, even if it's not free. Um, your insurance usually covers it. Um, the doctor prescribes it for you. Mm -hmm. the, the polycystic ovarian syndrome, that definitely means where you have multiple cysts on your ovaries, correct? Yes, yes. And you have... What possibly could be some symptoms that a woman may want to know? Um, basically, weight gain excess hair growth because you've got more male hormones in that. Um, those are the big symptoms that you see and, ex, you know, fatigue. So. And difficulty getting pregnant and difficulty yes. breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. they, I've heard that basically you can either have difficulty getting pregnant or difficulty breastfeeding. And I, I was able to get pregnant, but had the difficulty breastfeeding. Okay. Thank you, Don. So then you and Andy and Travis, you all do end up back home, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. pretty good. Mm -hmm. We did and things were great. And like I said, my breast milk had increased. And so I was excited. I was like, oh, I'm finally able to do this as a mom, you know? And so um, I went to the doctor and they did another ultrasound. And basically I had started bleeding again. That's why they did it. And he just said, there's so many clots and things in your uterus. And he said, we can either put you on medication or take you back into the hospital to do a procedure and scrape it all out. And I was just like, let's just get it done. I don't want to waste that time with medication. I was just fearful I'd hemorrhage again. So we went ahead and did that. Um, even after the procedure that evening when, you know, they were going to send me home, I wasn't feeling great. I was real dizzy and I couldn't even barely walk to the bathroom. And I was like, something's not right here. And so the next day, my temperature went up to 102. And I thought I had had an infection in the breast, um, the mastitis, a lot of that's common with a lot of women breastfeeding. And um, the doctor on call, which wasn't my normal doctor, said, you know, you've had so much instrumentation going in and out. I think you might have a uterine infection. Wow. And yeah, so she said, um, the office is getting ready to close, but I will wait here for you so we can do an ultrasound. And she said, cause they're not going to be able to do that in the ER. So let's go ahead and do that. So I thought that was amazing. I'm just like, my doctor group is incredible. And I mean, to have somebody wait for you after hours to do an ultrasound was just, that blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. 
So she did the ultrasound and said, definitely, I have a uterine infection. And at that point, I was just exhausted. I already had, you know, a couple surgeries. <laughs> I was barely recovered. Um, and so um, I said, can we go get something to eat? Cause I didn't want to go back in the hospital right away. I'd already had enough of hospitals. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. And she said, yeah, sure. It'll take me a while to get the orders written and everything. So go ahead and eat. And so I was like, well, let's go somewhere right ar around there. Let's just go to WW cousins. Cause it's right by Baptist East. And I was really weepy at that point. And we went inside and it was Travis, me and Andy. And we ran into some friends from church and they're amazing, amazing people, the most down to earth people you'll ever meet and just so right. helpful. Yeah, great people. Um, and so I just busted out into tears and told her what was going on. And we had contacted some family members and friends that had helped us with the kids before. And everybody was either out of town or doing something and nobody could watch the girls. And um, at that point, I was just extremely fearful because, you know, I didn't want to leave Andy at home. He needed to be with me. Right. Um, and I didn't have a bracelet or anything for him in the hospital. So I was afraid somebody would take him in the middle of the night when I was sleeping. And, you know, Travis, we couldn't leave our girls alone, home alone because they were too young. So I was just completely stressed out. Well, they offered to take the girls and then it was going to be Father's Day. So they were taking him to the pool to swim and everything. And it was, it was just the absolute right moment that they were there at that place. I was like, it was a God thing. There's just no other explanation just to be at that exact time. And then to do that for the girls. And that made the girls feel like everything was going to be okay too. Cause they were having fun and doing something they normally don't get to do. It was exciting. Yeah. So. And again, there, there you are so willing to accept help, Dawn. I just mm -hmm. think that that has become a, a strength for you. That is something I think that, that I need to practice a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I really admire that in you all. Oh, thank you. I had to, I had to fight to do that though. Cause like I said, I want to do everything myself, yes. but I learned to accept that help. What would you, what would you tell other women if they were in your shoes, you know, difficult pregnancy and already had a couple of children and what's some advice that you would give them definitely to be open to help, huh? Well, yeah, I would, I would definitely say call out for help. You know, we used a lot of Facebook. I know Facebook is bad for a lot of things, but I mean, honestly, I just put out there, Hey, can anybody help? And people just volunteered in droves. And I, I, I kind of think, you know, if you don't ask people for help, they're not going to know you need it. That's right. And so, but on the other hand, you know, you need to be willing to accept that help. And, and also too, if you're, if you know somebody going through that, don't wait to ask too, you know, you have a responsibility kind of to jump in and be that person and, and do things that you wouldn't think about normally. Just go ahead and offer to do laundry and get laundry detergent from the store. Go take a grocery trip, bring them a meal, take the kid, other kids somewhere, or bring them people brought us little um, coloring books and craft items and different things like that. Mm -hmm. So I've learned so much, you know, you really have with this journey of yours. And, and, you know, I'm curious if you look back and if you could have the younger Dawn sitting there in front of you, the pregnant with Andy, what would you tell that beautiful lady? I would just say it's going to be a rough ride, but accept that help and seek it out. I mean, you have to rely on the community. There's no other way it could have been done. So I would have probably told myself to accept help earlier, you know, and I think we had, we didn't touch on this before, but I think after all that had happened and my body was tired and it didn't bounce back like it normally did. And I'd been through so much. Um, I was, I was really experiencing depression after all that. And I knew that wasn't me because I could hear in my mind, I'm like, okay, Dawn, this is not you. These are hormones you know, this is hormones talking. Yes. And so I think I probably should have talked to my doctor about that. Now I, I probably would early on and that would have saved me a lot more hassle just because if that's not something you need to deal with on your own. I mean, thankfully I had friends who are social workers and nurses and they're like, Dawn, how are you? What's going on? They check they, on talk oh, yeah. they talked with me. They, they did all kinds of special things. I mean, like I was telling you before, 
you know, I had, I was not working. My husband was working at the time. Things were tight. We didn't have money for diapers and I didn't even put it out there, but one of my friends brought diapers and wipes and just laid them on our front porch and said, Hey, we left something for you. And multiple people did things like that. And so ask for the help, talk about your feelings, talk about your emotions, tell your doctor, because I, I should have probably been put on some medication temporarily just to help me through those times, because that's a lot. I mean, <laughs> I didn't realize at the time, like how much was done to my body and how hard it was to recover. Yes. So, so you would advise other women, hey, it would be all right to tell your doctor, I feel a little depressed. Oh, definitely. They, they know a lot more and they've experienced a lot more. They can prescribe you things if you need it or send you to a little counselor or, you know, something because your hormones are just completely messed up after delivery and, and especially been, after surgeries. Huh? Yeah, you had been through a lot. Your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So women that have gone through a lot of surgeries and procedures or who have had, you know, miscarriages. I mean, I had my dad's death, two miscarriages, you know, the placenta separation, all that. And then all the complications after all that piled up on me. Yes. <laughs> so you definitely had experienced your share of grief. Mm -hmm, definitely. But you know, I hear so much, there's so much goodness in your story and so much strength in you and your family. And you had told me that, you know, your advice to reach out to other people and ask, and now sometimes you will take a casserole to somebody or you will find out if somebody needs something. You do that. Oh, definitely. Well, I didn't realize how much help that would be. You know, like at church, we had people that would say, oh, sign up if so-and-so's had a baby and everything. And until it, I went through it myself and realized like, hey, this is an amazing help just to have, not to have to cook a meal, not to have to go to the grocery store to buy that stuff. I mean, I couldn't grocery shop. Travis would have to do it. But like I said, if you do that for somebody, it is such an amazing thing. Um, so I learned that, you know, go do errands for people, take their kids. If, you know, of course, if you trust them <laughs> um, and you know, buy them gift cards to, you know, for gasoline or a dinner somewhere to take out. Some people don't like to cook. Some people are like, hey, what, what's your favorite restaurant? We'll order you a meal from there. Let me know what you want. And they would do that. So all those things that were done to me helped me to learn to do those for other people. Very so, good. I mm -hmm. admire that so much that you did. You learned so much, even though you had a difficult time. Mm -hmm. How you reach out to other people and you help them. I bet your children see that too. And that will make your children reach out and help. Oh, them. yeah, they do. It's funny because if they find out that somebody they know, like their friends have a family member who's sick or something like that, they're like, mom, let's make them a meal. Yeah, oh, let's awesome. make dessert. Yeah, yeah they're, you know, they just go all out. And my, my oldest daughter, she loves to cook and everything. So she's always making people stuff and they all get involved. If somebody's sick, they're like, we got to help them. And, you know, Beautiful. when I was on bed rest and things, everybody found out about Andy on Facebook. I kind of forgot to mention this, but we had people all over praying um, for Andy and some little kids would pray every single day. You know, they'd be like, Oh, my daughter prayed for Andy every day. Exactly. You know, it was, yeah. So my kids do that now too. And if we find out somebody like through yeah. COVID, somebody's having respiratory problems or things like that, the kids pray or, you know, it's, it's really powerful. Your example to them. Yes. So. And you told me uh, mentioning the COVID that you actually put something out on your uh, neighborhood Facebook. Yes. I just um, realized, you know, one of our neighbors came down with COVID who's our friend and we went to the grocery for them. Like they did a Kroger click list or whatever. And we went ahead and picked it up and I put it in their, their garage so their kids could come out and get the groceries and we'd make them several meals and everything. And I was just thinking, you know, if somebody in the neighborhood has COVID and they don't have anybody, how devastating would that be if you even you know, you don't have family around, you have kids, you can't take care of your kids because you're so sick. And so we basically just decided in our neighborhood, hey, if, if you have COVID, put it out there on Facebook, tell us how many family members you have. If you have any food allergies, you know, anything you need, we'll go pick up medications for you. If you need some Sprite or ginger ale, crackers, anything you need, you should not be alone. And so we had a whole list of people sign up and say, hey, if somebody needs it, I'm willing to go. That's I don't cook, awesome. but I can give a carry out, you know? So it's incredible. I mean, I, I just, I think people want to help 
And if they know there's a need, they will rise to meet that need. Just have to put it out there. I totally agree. People are truly wonderful. They are. I mean, it, it was incredible. I, I tear up now just thinking of all the people who helped me and not my family during that pregnancy and the complications. I mean, it was incredible. I, I forgot to mention, we had talked about it before, but, you know, um, when I put on Facebook, when I had the 50% chance of Andy passing, you know, I had put something on Facebook about it. And one of my friend's um, husbands was an OB and my doctor wasn't on call and she asked if I wanted to talk to him. And he called me that night when I was so devastated and basically encouraged me and gave me statistics and things like that and walked me through it. And I will never forget that. And, and people did many amazing things like that. Things that, you know, you might think, oh, that's not big. Oh my gosh, they mean the world to people. Yes. So, I mean, Facebook. Is, Those little things are important too, aren't they? That people oh, they are. Yeah, just knowing that somebody was praying for me. I mean, I could see list after list of people, hey, we're praying for you. My kids are praying for you. I mean, it was just incredible. And that gave me strength. Very I mean, it, yeah. So well, do that. Even if, you, even if you just jot down on, you know, Facebook or text somebody or give them a call or put a note in the mail, a card or something, I'm praying for you today. I mean, it means the world. Yes. Well, I really appreciate you sharing. And you are a very strong woman. You have a beautiful family and gold stars to Travis for everything. Thank you. <laughs> and your beautiful children. And I just really want to thank you for sharing today. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to. Yes. And I want to thank our dear listeners for listening again and remind them that if you think you have a story that you would like to share with the Hawks, then go to 3hawkshaven.com and we have a page there, Hawks on the Wire, and you can submit your name and your email. We would love to hear from you. And remember, when we share our humanity, we share the possibility to heal. Thank you so much.